Mother membrane, memory remember, reborn, born, whole, more, more, more. Remember, remaster, master, mother, motion, emotion. Remember, remake, rewake, awake, stay, away. For seven weeks, you have been a quiet conversation inside. The blurs of lit colors in these rooms move through me into words, into sounds, flushes of flavor and sensation, mint and sadness under my tongue, warmth and tenderness in my belly, a soft ripple down my neck and ribs, my thighs, my toes. The edges of my mind dim and brighten, get trapped under clear and frosted glass with secrets and unsolvable riddles. I think of time, life, death, I think of violence and shame, the old country my parents never went back to, but that they carry inside their bodies, that I carry inside my body still. Blend, blind, belie, lie, sigh, die inside. Brain, braid, lead, hate. All this immaculate light and color, so much immaculate, but I know I am not immaculate, not this history, not this body. My history is full of shadow and torn memories of lingering pain and violence. These beautiful orbs dissolve me and I beg for this. I have always begged for this, a place without the history of me. Believe it when I tell you I'd like nothing more than unzip my head and skin off and walk into these orbs of light, into a place of no pain or war, no forced forgetting. So against all this beauty and all this light, I see the shadows move out all around me, crawling into my hair and into my skin. I know I cannot hold this beauty. Its softness wrecks me. But this room holds no thread of softness. My body understands these glass orbs with their bright ribbons, their absence of oxygen. It understands how things get frozen in time and the sorrow of that. I see my parents and their values when they first came to their new country behind hard glass to keep them vivid and strong. But what if their joy froze too? their innocence and wonder and their permission to be soft and get things wrong? What if instead my parents had kept changing and moving on the inside like people that stayed behind? Who would they be now? Forgot, hot, taut, hard, shard, shadow, shallow, shade, fade. I first learned about synesthesia when I was eight. It was something people didn't talk about, like they didn't talk about magic or ghosts or death, even though those things were also real. It describes experiencing one of your senses through another, seeing a color and hearing a sound, hearing a letter or number and seeing a location in space. Quiet conversations, crossovers, metaphors, color becomes feeling, becomes memory, becomes my mother's hananim, her favorite word in Korean, becomes a flush of joy in my heart, becomes the image of my sister's open mouth scream, becomes a group of cells in my neck muscle, my foot bone, my knuckle. I believe in the non-memories of those before one's time can get worked into the imprint of a person's body. I wonder when my parents were forced to learn Japanese and English when they were little, and their tongues and throats muscles were unable to move in the ways of the, Japan, of the languages yet, if they saw shapes of words on their tongues. When they were taught the word smile in Japanese, did they suddenly taste chocolate? Did they hear the sound of gunfire in their heads? A hot drip in their throats? Guishin, sekai, byo, beat, sarang, ghost, color, bone light, love. When my mother and father were still seeds inside their mothers, bits of their country were getting erased, disappearing land, trees, clothing, language, birth names, disappearing teenage girls forced into Japanese military brothels and called toilets as they were raped, disappearing royal palaces turned into zoos. My father wet his bed until he was 16. He was called midget and pee pee boy, beaten by his brothers and his father who felt like half men and said he was a half man too. So he decided he'd show them all, he'd go to America 
make some money. My sister smoked in secret, one's tongue an angry knot of curse words, the other's arms and legs blooming with purple bruises from my father's slaps and from his expensive new golf club. My mother became a ghost. She used the same yellow sponge around the house and around my father's drunk rages and absorbed it all. Just like her sewing projects, her incessant shopping escapades for the right clothes and jewelry and furniture for the house, like she used the endless recipes that if she got just right would unlock her from her cage. A woman finally free, free to do what she wanted to do. So the sponge in the kitchen was always full of things, food and spilt beer, small chips of plate and glass. And later when I went to clean the blood from my father's bite mark on her hand, I saw how the red bloomed into the towel I held there and remembered how her sponge was already used and dirty, busy holding on to too many other things. Again and again, I put my face into the bend of her neck and breathed in its sour smell. Amma, I'd say, it's okay, tell me. Tell me all of it, I am listening. Another visit here and I see blooming things, blooming life, blooming blood, pretty flowers, slow motion movies of rupture, of healing. Years later, a bruise looks more like a dark gray whale swimming deep inside my skin. I poke my bruises until I feel the tenderness of something that once broke a fading memory as my body heals but one I don't want to forget. I want to know what it has witnessed, what my parents and their parents' bodies have witnessed. At night, ghosts cut their teeth into me, know me, feel me, remember me. When they are tired, their teeth recede and they sing songs about their still empty bellies. But then they vanish like all my dreams with morning's blue light. At night, ghosts, sorry, when dreams vanish from the mind, where do they go? Last month, a massage therapist pushed and pushed her warm magic hands into the scales on my back and she said my body was angry and guarded all my muscles ready to punch her. I told her I was sorry and I didn't mean it. I have my father's bad teeth, his bad back. My molars are cracked and worn down from rubbing hard circles into them at night in the base of my spine. I feel shooting pains like bright stars cometing into my lumbar muscles and down my legs into my sacrum, my pelvis along the crest of my low back where the two halves of me connect. There is the hot energy of stars and all those cracks vibrating me loose, wanting me to come undone so that this thing that has always wanted to break me finally can. I wonder what lives in the in-between space of bone and muscle and fascia, if it's the grief of having to swallow oneself, one's history, language, and name whole. Hogishim, Yuyanham, Yeonhyong, Il, Japida, curiosity, tenderness, balance. Would, ha would things have been different if, it was if I was taught to reach for the thing these things when I was little? Because instead I grew up hard and sick. I drank and bit people and laughed like a demon who lost her face. But my blackouts were medicine too. They gave me the sweet gift of forgetting. When I drank, I drank with my father and his father and all the fathers before that, links to the past that were erased by the erasing of land and records and names. And for just a little while, our family could all be together, laugh and believe we were at the center of things. Who wouldn't want this forgetfulness and love? But I grew tired of this, started to see something else in the erased places of my mind. And it was the constellation that would exist millions of years before and a million years after Korea was no longer Korea, Japan and America were no longer Japan and America, when all the land had caught fire and disappeared under warm, lifeless water full of bleached coral. I decided to find my memory, take it back from the ruins of outer space and lost time, and the hardness fell off me like hard, thick scales, old nails too, which I didn't need anymore because I was no longer a dragon, no longer needed to fly and bite and punch every single living thing. I didn't know that when you stop drinking and your memory came back, new songs appear for you. 
removing memory, removing time, slips of thin membrane, the fluid that suspended me inside my mother, the sack that broke and spilled out another alien child, brand new and ancient. Then a first bleed, a first kiss, drops of first semen swimming up and down inside of me as I lay in pain. This is what being a woman must be like. This is what being a fossil with no name must be like, a body in pain. I dreamt of black marbles rolling out of my ears and my mouth dropping out of my vagina. When I held them up, I saw they were full of tiny stars. And I knew then that the Korean night still lived inside my body, the stardust of my bones, my helix-shaped DNA, the years of darkness, of erasing. I bought black marbles and put them on the table next to my bed so I could watch them at night, see how they became dark pupils watching me, telling me to be quiet and good. But my family was a hungry ghost, never able to get full. Even if I were a billion shiny stars, it would never be enough to make bright that black Korean night. Lately, I've started to wonder what would happen if I gave myself permission to be soft, to remove the glass dome, walk into the bright orb, fill up, then let go, all of it. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what would that be like? Thank you. In 1990, I got my first apartment in the East Village on 5th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. I was 22 and in my last year of undergrad at New York University. The place was not my first choice, rather what I could afford at $3.25 a month with two housemates and in walking distance of school. What was I getting myself into, living with two strangers, also two NYU students, James and Chad, but my boyfriend Billy said they were fine and he would be comfortable spending the night. Mine was the last room of what I learned was a railroad apartment in a fifth floor walk up. The front door opened into a cloud of stale sheets and cheap cologne. The first room was a small kitchen with small versions of stove, fridge, and counter. There was room for a small table, though we never got one. To the right, a cramped, mildewy bathroom to the left, French doors opened into James's room. On the other side of his room, another set of French doors opened to Chad's room and the concentration of cologne. From the back of Chad's room, a plain wood door opened to an eight by 10 room, the end of the line, full of sunshine. Aside from the bathroom, my room was the only private space and unlike the rest of the apartment, the only room with natural light, I quickly learned that closing my door only shut out James and Chad. But from inside the room, two tall windows on adjacent walls looked out across the air shafts to the worlds in the neighboring apartments. From the window directly across from my door, a couple cooked and sat down to watch TV. Sometimes they began to make out and the curtains were drawn. From the window on the right, the neighboring apartment was so close as if I could reach in and stick my fingers. Sometimes an old man with a graying afro and thick black glasses sat by the window. When I wasn't in class, at work as an artist's assistant, at the library studying or hanging out with Billy, I sat on the twin futon on the floor, illuminated dust floating around me, wondering what life was and who I might become, who I was allowed to become. In the city, I distanced myself from my childhood in Pennsylvania and from parents who immigrated from Taiwan to the States as adults, who treated me as a foreigner as I became in their eyes more and more American. That my little room was lit up felt like an act of grace and permission for something I did not yet know. When I first moved in, at the end of the summer, the windows were open. Phrases of John Coltrane wafted in with sounds of pedestrians and traffic, 
The grit of the city drowned out the stench of the apartment. From across the air shaft, the old man's friendly hello startled me. It didn't occur to me that the windows that I looked through would look back at me. Afterwards, he would wave or make eye contact, though maintaining my privacy, I did not acknowledge him. My room was a place I could be free from people's gaze and the necessity to be anything that I was not, even if this was imagined. Billy sometimes spent the night and waved to the man in the mornings, surprised that I ignored him. Looking through the bare windows, he asked, where do you get dressed? Rather than traversing the rooms where Chad might be having a sex party, under spinning lights to Madonna's Like a Prayer, or climbing over James's anarchist friends from Baltimore who camped out on foam pads spread on the floor, I stayed in my room and crouched down close to the wood floor to change. How long are you going to be able to keep that up? Billy said. Do you want me to help put up curtains or blinds? Thinking I could figure out things for myself in a creative way, I declined. My clothes lay folded in neat piles next to stacks of books that lined the room. A full-length mirror was propped up against the exposed brick wall. Eventually, Billy brought a desk lamp and a folding chair and that acted as a side table. This was all I needed. I experimented with taping rice paper over the windows, but didn't like the light being blocked. The windows remained naked. Every time I got dressed, it felt like I was hiding. I had spent my entire life in Pennsylvania covering up who I was, made to feel ashamed of how I looked. I tried to forget classmates who tugged at the corners of their eyes and made crass rhyming noises as if it were all in good fun. I tried to forget friends asking if I slept on my face because my nose and face were flat. Yes, those were the kinds of friends I grew up with, and the really good friends, the ones who said they didn't see that I looked different. Did they see me at all? How could I then see myself? I couldn't change my face, but I could change my body. For a summer during high school, I got into running and ran up to 15 miles a day, imagining I were running like a gazelle, running away, running until I was muscular and live, strong and free. This athleticism made me feel like I was better than the only other Asian American in my class, the piano teacher's daughter, whose posture showed her shrinking away from the world in apology. But no matter how strong I felt, I could not escape my face. The need to hide and mask myself had become part of who I was, whether this mask was one of confidence. In the sunlight of this little room, I had the hopes of shedding the masks and becoming myself, whoever that might be, whatever that meant. In the city, I didn't stand out, and this passed for fitting in. Men checked me out. This attention was both overwhelming and disturbing, how I went from being invisible and unattractive to being a morsel of meat to be shamelessly looked up and down how I could be asked to dinner before we had significant conversation, how a musician I dated briefly got on stage, swept his arm in my direction as he dedicated a song to me, even before he knew the first thing about me. The novelty of being taken out to dinner soon became lonely and tedious, the guy across the table in a trance, oogling my face and body, anything I said unheard. When I met Billy, it wasn't like his understanding of me stopped at my exterior. We connected in how we rejected the mainstream and what was expected of us. He rejected the burden of pressures heaped on men that caused his father high blood pressure and a host of ensuing health issues. Within a year, his father would die of cancer. Eventually, I dressed in the dark if I were up early or going to bed late, and eventually I simply didn't worry. I didn't care that anyone could see me. I had a strong and beautiful body. Was it so bad if people saw me naked? They shouldn't be looking in my room anyway. I tried not to think of the man by the window and went about my business as if he didn't exist. Even this was pleasurable. 
treating someone the way I was treated, as if they didn't exist. He was not always there, but that he sometimes was became a reason to undress. There were times I would peel my clothes off like the rind of a fruit. Began to, uh, I began to feel the window panes between us, the shape of the air shaft between us, the diminishing space between his eyes and my flesh, tentative glances, seeking glances, glances, seeking permission. I could feel that, too. At first, I kept my back to his window, his eyes like dripping honey, along the shape of my neck, slope of shoulders, running down my spine to the inward curve of my lower back, dripping down my buttocks, my legs, and I felt more woman for it. It wasn't like the obscene greed of so many unwanted and unexpected gazes on the streets. And with Billy, we were two puppies, playful. But I liked the fullness of being woman, carnal, desired, and full of agency. Growing up, I saw no clues of whether this could exist for an Asian female. All I had seen was Mariko san in the TV miniseries of James Clavell's Shogun. She was pristine, pristine and perfect, like a doll being seduced by Blackthorn. I identified with him, not the prey. I was no doll. When my mother retrieved her old photo albums from her brother who visited from Taipei, I could not stop looking at the black and white photos of my mother lined up with her sisters. They stood proud and beautiful on a staircase, quaffed and made up in pencil skirts, blouses, and wavy permed hair. They didn't question who they were. Is this how I might, had, might be had I grown up in Taiwan? Not questioning of my own existence. As time passed, I allowed myself to be seen from all sides, my small breasts, chocolate kiss of nipples, belly, patch of black hair. It felt powerful to show myself without shame or embarrassment, not to fear being a bad woman, the wrong kind of woman inviting the wrong company, not to fear inviting violation, violation. So many fears dominated how I could be present, so much shame of how I looked. Didn't I have a right as a woman, a Taiwanese-American woman, to take up space, exist, and be beautiful? Didn't I have a right to enjoy my body for myself? And what was the relationship of this body who, who could take pleasure in being strong and being seen to the face that was used, also used to hiding? I felt fragmented. My face was a marker of racial inequities, my body a marker of gender inequities. Here in my room, from my window, I controlled what he saw and when. I wasn't threatened. He wasn't going to call me a bitch for not sleeping with him. I learned to give permission. I felt his appreciation, his pleasure, and in this unexpected dance, I could explore being sensuous and embodied in a way that was more satisfying than being with a boyfriend whose desire spilled into me as if I were simply a receptacle. Sometimes in the afternoons, the man, I never did know his name, sat on the stoop with his friends when I went out for a jog. We'd exchange greetings and nothing more. I had mostly forgotten about this time and this affair, except finding recently, while cleaning out my parents' apartment, a box of keepsakes and this photo. My parents, similar frowns etched across their faces, standing next to me on the stoop of the apartment building. I am fully present, my face glowing with hope. Billy would have taken the photo. It was the afternoon of my graduation.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I wanted to start with a poem um, by Ilya Kaminsky, who's a Ukrainian-American poet um, and grew up there um, during the Soviet years. Um, just to recognize what's, what's happening as we're meeting. Um, okay. Four a.m. bombardment. My body runs in Arlimovsk Street, my clothes in a pillowcase. I look for a man who looks exactly like me to give him my Sonia, my name, my shirt. It has begun. Neighbors climb the trolleys at the fish market, breaking all their moments in half. Trolleys burst like intestines in the sun. Pavel shouts, I am so fucking beautiful, I cannot stand it. Two boys, still holding tomato sandwiches, hop in the trolley's light. Soldiers aim at their faces, their ears. I can't find my wife. Where is my pregnant wife? I, a body, adult male, awaits to explode like a hand grenade. It has begun. I see the blue canary of my country, pick breadcrumbs from each citizen's eyes, pick breadcrumbs from my neighbor's hair. The snow leaves the earth and falls straight up as it should. To have a country so important, to run into walls, into streetlights, into loved ones as one should, the blue canary of my country runs into walls, into streetlights, into loved ones. The blue canary of my country watches their legs as they run and fall. This is a short poem from my book, um, the exhibit really resonated with me, and um, my book is called Day of Clean Brightness. <clears throat> Dear Trap, when you say teleological, I think geological, the layers laid down in ashy additions, Think paleological, the urcat loved for being first, fish heads and shrimp tails. The land rises up, the stone wears down, footholds one in front of another in the hips required zag. Is God mystery or what you know, the rectangular hole for catching deer? Standing on a mesa top close to the dead a thousand miles away. The sun mists the mountain dusk, the bent light like a cataract, the decay of sight. Like cracking the window to hear whoever might call. Um, I'm going to read um, a sequence um, that was inspired by the exhibit. Um, okay. <clears throat> if you ask, my earliest memory is a grassy field at nursery school. A summery day with bees that concern me, a boy vague in the periphery. 
There could be something earlier, a courtyard in Taiwan. But I was two for my first trip, and I spent so much of my childhood peering at family albums that the photos themselves became memory. I am holding a film strip up to the light, my gaze open to its mystery. The striped knit tank has slipped off one shoulder. Red metal bars keep me from falling from the concrete steps, smooth and cool despite the swelter of monsoon heat. An opening like the mouth of a whale into a whiteness that smooths, walls into floor, blanks corners. The interior horizon, a diffuse circle of blush in a curved plane of creamy light. How to be edgeless in the air, an atmosphere. How stars and planets expand the universe like a beginning and end, beginning and end. Take a cloud and follow it. What was drift becomes flow, determined as a ray of light. The dusk that is my father is a caldera of snow, balanced by a sky of waning blue. There are traces, the geometry of snowshoes and poles, curved to the tree line, line to the road. Boots hold to the crust, one yard, two, then a step that breaks the surface, drops knee deep through a mix of ice, powder, and air, an alchemy of the sun. This, then, is the mind's method, a pace that accepts surprise. You read sound, and I travel to the pale conch shell that sits atop a dish of smaller shells on the vinyl-covered sill in the dining room. The outer surface is leached of color the way keepsakes pale and powder from the ocean. The inside retains a smoothness that speaks as promised when held to the ear reverberation of the dark room's murmurs. Not everyone has a sound, like a hollow and the ear made for tugging, the pianissimo of columns cycling in shades of dim, the orbit of persons discerning shapes behind a veil and colors at moments with a clarity like an epiphany darting in, the infinite between sound and silence. Sphere as concentration, the surface of an orb, a penetration of color, how a sphere is one. How a sphere next to a sphere next to a sphere suggests a sameness. As if you could know by holding it in your sight. How the room tilts and what was red splits to a murky turquoise. Within it, the spout of a hexagon. A pinpoint of orange mirrors a slant the hue of a cone. How a row of lights transpose in amber like a constellation of stars above and below. The danger year asked me to look at the sun without its February veil. Imprint the light into memory where it could recur like the jittery star of a sparkler exit sign in a darkened room. My father, are you the faint scent of burning as I walk, the pavement changing in snowbanks, slicks of ice, slush ridged by the last tire passing? 
Are you the light glinting off metal as bright as the sun, or the sparkle in the untouched snow rippled in a slow melt? We sit in the kinship of a bench, the back wall gesturing us forward, the time lapse like an oscillation of days and nights. How does the light enter like a breath? the slow exhale of sea glass. What you said is origin, the bare profile of trees in a paling dusk, our, our gaze drawn to the light, upward, outward, and we disperse backwards into our histories, the branching of ancestors, the many origins the eye gathers in. the trickle of ice melt along the rain chain, the ice itself separating like a husk from the form, collecting in the cupped petals, the sound delicate like a scent on the wrist, suggesting memory, how the light appeared in the waves lapping at the shore, like a presence all our figments of the future and past distilled into something we could see and still not touch, like holding hands with a feeling. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat>